Friends, a new Ferrari is always a big deal, but this, this is more than just a new Ferrari. This is a carrying case, arguably a very attractive one, of technologies that have a lot of business to tend to. First and foremost, this technology in there that signals the future direction of Ferrari, and second, and maybe not as readily apparent, this little car on its own is going to take on big governments all around the world. So rather than go through the bullets and numbers of the engine of a new Ferrari, I feel we need to understand the gravity of the situation here. That is a Ferrari with two turbos strapped to it. And the answer to the question in our walk around film, what were the last two Ferraris that were fitted from the factory with turbochargers? That was the 87 F40 and the 85 288 GTO. And I still very much want a 288 GTO, even though they've gone from 200,000 to 600,000 to 800,000, 2 million, almost 2 million in value in just the past couple of years alone. Anyway, I digress. What do we have here? This is a 3.9 liter twin turbo V8. Uh, puts out 552 horsepower, which comes in at 7,500 RPM. The torque is not as straightforward. The torque is limited in the first three gears uh, to 455 pound-feet of torque, but then in seventh gear, uh, you can take it all the way up uh, to 4,750 RPM, and that's where you get uh, 557 pound-feet of torque. Now, as we said, two turbochargers, max boost is 18.9 uh, PSI. We're gonna talk more about the importance and relevance of turbochargers throughout this episode, so we'll come back to it. But there's a couple of technology pieces I wanna cover here. Uh, number one, yeah, this is a Ferrari, so notice where the engine is, but do you remember our Z06 episode? We talked about uh, front mid-engine, but that engine, even though it was pretty far back, it was still sorta over the front axle. This is completely behind the front axle. Uh, the second thing is, it's a flat plane crank. Uh, so basically, what does that mean? Uh, a flat plane crank means it's an alternating firing order, which basically translates to more efficient use of the exhaust gases. Now, Ferrari's gone a couple of steps further, and they've changed the entire uh, exhaust manifold where all the runners are equal length. So it's further efficiency of the exhaust gases. Now, there is one other benefit, and rather than me tell you, I think you should hear it. So you're thinking, what's the big deal? Turbos. Everybody's doing turbo these days. Ferrari, they're late to the turbo party anyway. Way wrong. This is unlike any other turbo we have driven. By limiting the torque in the first three years, what Ferrari has done is given you a completely flat power curve. It's like almost no curve. So like here we are in canyons, and this thing will pull out of anything. There's never a point where you are flat-footed. But then, let's go into a higher gear. It's almost like VTEC, where it just screams up to 7,500 to get that high horsepower. It's, oh my god, it's like a dual personality engine. You've got this flat power curve of a V8, but you get this peakiness at the same time when you really, really want to push it. Oh. Listen to that. Oh, Santa Maria, Madre de Dios. Now, aside from the elephant underneath the hood, what are some of the other changes? Well, number one, there's a faster steering rack. Number two is the brakes. They have now fitted carbon ceramic rotors as standard to all California Ts. Then the springs, 12% stiffer. Then uh, the dampers. So lower friction, but they have more adjustments. So are you guys familiar with the setup of Ferraris? They've got this uh, red knob on the steering wheel. Forget about what they call it. When you start playing around with this thing, it's like summoning Batman. Anyway, now there's another button on the other side of the steering wheel. So you got comfort, you got sport, and you can keep it in sport so you can keep uh, the engine in sport mode. Uh, but then you can get a more compliant ride, say like around town. That is called bumpy mode. Now, let's go back to like setup type things. And so we already talked about the engine is here, right? Well, over here, you got the transaxle and that, 
That sets us up for a different kind of weight distribution. So in the front, you've got 47% of the weight here, but the rear, 53%. So those numbers have a lot to do with driving dynamics. When you look at this car, there's actually a little bit of a visual trick. Uh, you think this thing has a really long wheelbase. It doesn't. Until you put this car in situations like this, where you're canyon carving or going around a track, do you notice it actually has a very short wheelbase. That combined with more weight in the rear means you have to kind of get used to a little bit of body roll in the rear. Um, I would argue, for me, I would want it set up a little bit stiffer, but you know, this is a GT car, so for what it is, it's set up beautifully. And because it's a, it's a shorter wheelbase than you think, you get a bit of oversteer if you're not paying attention. Uh, totally different driving dynamics than, say, the Aston Martin or uh, the SL65. Then there's the transmission. Now this is not new. This is the F1 gearbox we've known over the years and Ferrari has just refined it so much to make it so fast shifting. Like in other applications, you can use so many gears when you're in situations like this. Uh, but here, this is the first time it's paired with a 3.9 liter V8. The part about the pairing is it takes advantage of the wide power band. I feel like I need to call my lawyers to, to give you a disclaimer, but it makes you a better, faster driver. And that's saying a lot in a car that's meant to be a GT. I would argue that this combination, it is so good, it's almost, it, it, it almost is too dynamic for the chassis setup of this car. Like, I can believe that Ferrari had to detune that engine to match it to the chassis setup of this car. This is a GT car. Let's focus a bit on the interior. There are two big changes here, a revised dashboard and new seats. Now, if I'm being honest, the seats, I think they need a bit more support, but then again, it's a GT car, perhaps I'm being pedantic. And notice the color and trim of this car. If you're familiar with our show, uh, you may have seen our options game. We're actually not going to play the options game with this car. We're gonna play what's called the options aportivo, and it has nothing to do with where this car is manufactured, but we are gonna cover what is fitted as standard and what is fitted as optional, as well as blue seat belts. Very neat touch. Uh, then, look at the screen there. Do you remember when you went from your old school like Motorola StarTac, which I still love that design, to a smartphone, how drastic of a change that was in your life? That's what that is. That is CarPlay. And this car that we're looking at right here, which is ending in serial number 277, this is one of the first four Ferraris in the country fitted with CarPlay. And it's so important, we're gonna do a standalone episode of actually driving in traffic with it. And all I can say is I am going to cry like a schoolgirl when they come take this car from me. But let's get back to actually cars. So this matte pocket here, look at this. When I first saw it, I'm noticing the color and the stitching and all that kind of stuff. Then I noticed, I thought it would have been like cardboard or plastic underneath and then the leather cover, but all it is, is the leather so you can actually open the matte pocket. It pivots a little bit. That is old world craftsmanship in car making. So a couple of additional notes about the interior. If you've been in a recent Ferrari as of late, you know this steering wheel here. So everything is on the steering wheel. There is no uh, column stalks. There's not even a lot of buttons off on the side of the dash. And then of course, you've got your Batman button here to answer the call. Uh, that's if you want to turn off uh, complete stability control. And believe it or not, you can. It turns absolutely everything off. You know the old saying, the difference between men and boys is the price of their toys? I guess Ferrari realizes that, you know, if you're gonna play with your toy, you gotta play responsibly. Uh, but I digress. And then the paddle shifters, they are connected to the steering column, which I much prefer in cars that have these type of gearboxes. But notice they're a lot taller in this uh, latest update to the California. And then there's a trip computer off to the side here, and that gives me more gauges, basically. So I've got uh, water temperature, I've got oil temperature, 
I've got oil pressure, a voltmeter, and get this, not only tire pressure, but tire temperature. And then speaking of gauges, let's go back over to the center gauge here. So it's not just PSI, let's, let's put the, let's go down, there you go, now we got it. Uh, seven, two, eight, seven. But then if I tap through it, there's the clock, there's the temperature, it gives me turbo response and turbo efficiency. So there's one other tidbit about the interior which I kind of feel funny bringing up. So Fiat and Chrysler, they merged back in 2009, right? Um, well now it's fully on FCA and Fiat is the parent company of Ferrari, at least for the time being. Well, uh, Ralph Scheele, who's a friend of ours, we love Ralph. Um, he flat out told us the first collaboration the two companies ever did together was the Dodge Dart. Well, the collaboration continues here, believe it or not. So well, have you driven a Chrysler recently where they have the radio controls on the steering wheel and they're behind the steering wheel as opposed to here? Um, I personally think that is a significantly more intuitive way to do it. Well, guess what has them now? Let's put the hood down. Let's step back and let some of the design changes wash over us. Now, I am a huge fan of the way the F12 looks. And in my screwed up, loving British cars kind of way, I really like the FF. Uh, but here what they've done is they've grafted la familia look of the FF and the F12 onto the front of the California. Now let's press onto the rear. Do you guys remember the stacked tailpipes on the 09 California? Well, they've tossed those out uh, and replaced them with a traditional side-by-side -side setup. Uh, I personally much prefer this. Kind of harkens back to the original Cal Spider. And then there's the whole other side of this engine transmission and GT car pairing, and that is to take on governments, at least for Ferrari. What's the old saying? Two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Well, Ferrari is focusing on taxes. For example, the previous version of this car had a 4.3 liter V8 engine, uh, but in the US, it was subject to gas guzzler tax because it didn't hit certain MPG targets. And further, Ferrari is separate from the overall Fiat group in terms of cafe requirements. But then in countries that charge on a CO2 emissions taxing scheme, the old car was in a higher tax bracket because of its CO2 emissions out of the tailpipe. But then there's other markets like Ferrari's own home market, and more importantly, really for Ferrari sales in China, a displacement tax. So in China, anything over four liters has a pretty hefty tax on it. So what Ferrari has done by pairing this engine, this transmission, and this car is increase the fuel economy. So in the US, there's no longer a gas guzzler tax lower the CO2 emissions, so in countries like England, you don't pay a higher CO2 tax band, you're in a lower tax rate. And then in countries like China, now you understand why it's a 3.9 or 3.8 something V8, it's just below the displacement tax. So you get where Ferrari's going with this? what do we got? Well, a surprise. Full disclosure, friends, I did not expect to like this car this much. But that heart transplant, especially when it's paired with, and this is like heresy coming from a manual transmission guy like me, but paired with Ferrari's already otherworldly F1 gearbox, you know what? The best way to put it is this. Previously, the old generation car in the spectrum of SL65, Aston Martin, and the California, the California was really a distant third. This, now kind of at the top of that list. Let's put aside California for a minute and let's go back to this whole theme of turbocharging and Ferrari that we've been talking about throughout this entire episode. I've been very deliberate about this because it is huge, people. But now, picture this if you will. Take that same engine, put it here. Um, this is 3,800 pounds, maybe drop, say, 500 pounds, and then set up the car like a challenge for Dolly. Now that is a twin-turbo Ferrari I really want to drive. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a question. So uh, if you're going to buy a car like this, 
Now there's clearly two paths that are on offer. You've got the twin turbo Ferrari, and you've got like the 12 cylinder Aston Martin, or even a naturally aspirated V8. What would you want if you were buying a GT car like this? Now I'm gonna throw a couple of curveballs here. Tell me what you would want, why you would want it, and here's the real challenge. What part of the world do you live in and what is the tax scheme in that region that applies to your fancy GT car? Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, ciao. So here's the script. Click here to subscribe. Click here to watch one of our 350 other episodes. And most importantly, share us with your friends. You're only wasting half your life on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Moto Man TV, all one word. I don't care who you share us with. Share us with your enemies. Just give the gift of Moto Man.